Good morning, cybersecurity community, and welcome to MWISE here in Denver, Colorado. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by my fantastic co-host this week, John Furrier. John, welcome back to Colorado. Great to see you, Savannah. I love this show. It's one of my favorites of the year. It's deep tech, um, a lot of experts, and as the AI technology continues to evolve, it's enhancing business operations, it's significantly uh, new experiences, new capabilities, but it's also introducing new security threats, and that's going to be the focus of the show this week, so we're going to dig in. I'm really excited to learn, and what a better way to start than with Upin and Steph today. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Doing? Fabulous. Good How are you, man? <laughs> You're doing great in the cold. You wouldn't even know what it's <laughs> I mean, Definitely got my nice jacket. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Great color on you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you both so much for taking the time to start us off today. Quite a week in cybersecurity. Deloitte and Google working together for a long time right. on these AI challenges. Upin, why don't you open us up? Why is this week so important to Deloitte and why is the cybersecurity conversation front of mind? Security is front and center of AI. We cannot have good generative AI without good cybersecurity making it trustworthy and I feel that's why this, this week this, uh, this partnership is so important to us. Yeah, absolutely. Steph, when you think about AI and, and user experience, oh yeah, I love that this is your, your and we're combining that with security, how important is thinking about user experience in keeping everything secure? Uh, this is such a softball. By the way, I love it. I'm warming us up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> day one. I think, day about one. It. I think about it. I'm a true nerd. I lead the user experience team. It's a joy. It's also a huge challenge for similar reasons, too, because in security, you need to have precision. You need to have speed, but you need to have confidence. So therefore, a lot of the tools that we would design for the Defender, we would want to be easy to use, but you know, also be able to convey the signals of trust that would be required to be able to rely on those. And Gen AI, it's so early right, right now. Yeah. This, of course, the security practitioner is like, can I trust this res response? Is this going to help me or is this going to hinder me? And so there's a huge user experience challenge with AI. In fact, I often say AI is UX, especially yeah. in the future of the SOC. I'm going to borrow that. So I'm going to give you okay, for great. that. Okay, great. You get a t-shirt. Yeah, I love that. yeah um, one of the things that comes up is the uh, user experience that came up in uh, Kevin Mandy's keynote is the collaboration between teams. That was a huge point, um, not only the SOC advantages in terms of the, the AI piece, but also working together to identify the threats. How is the UX bringing into the collaboration? Because the business is seeing more threats, especially with models and the questions every year, he lists them on the, on the keynote, new questions pop up, what boards are thinking, risk management, big part of it. So how are teams working together, both you know, internally to solve the, the, the threat problem, but also, is it getting easier with Gen AI? What are some of the innovations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can talk about it someday, and then I think maybe we talk a little bit about some of the principles around yeah. trustworthy AI. Yeah. Um, so, definitely being able to collapse the attack surface and enable teams to work together. I mean, LLMs are uniquely positioned to bring in disparate data that might be, for example, in threat intelligence, some of the latest Mandiant research reports, yeah. right? That we'd be able to summarize those be able to identify particular issues and then generate things that would be pushed into the SOC automatically, a new detection rule, for example. Those are the kinds of things that are trying to create a much more streamlined user experience that enables a CTI team and a SecOps team to work together much more fluidly. Yeah. yeah, and so when we talk to clients, we look at this from two perspectives. The first perspective obviously is Gen AI attacking us. Now you have a hacker that doesn't need coffee breaks, doesn't sleep, it's at it all the time. And so how do you yeah. protect against it? And the only way to do it effectively is to use Gen AI ourselves and get that SOC analyst who doesn't yeah. need coffee breaks either. So that's one aspect we work with a lot. The second is making sure we use Gen AI responsibly, safely, in a secure manner. And that's where we built what we call our trustworthy AI framework basically with three core principles. One is you want fairness from your model. Second is you want accountability. You want it to not hallucinate. You want it to do what it is supposed to do. And finally, keeping that model secure so we are not giving away our data, we are not yeah. giving away our intellectual property. But that's how we look at the world. One is Gen AI attacking us. How do we protect against it? 
And then secondly, how do we use Gen AI yeah. securely yeah. in a trustworthy manner? And, and these were also some of the foundational elements for a partnership that we had in creating a sock of the future vision, yeah. which was all about making sure that you know, automation, that the collaboration and the yeah. sort of AI infused and really AI guided experiences are just how this is going to be so yeah. that the teams can you know, really defend. At Google Next last year, one of the big things that came out on our Cube's uh, data segment there was the data is self-forming, so you get a lot of data engineers and data scientists, yeah. and then you get security teams. So we heard, you know, again in the keynote, get the security teams involved faster on the new AI stuff, but also bring the data engineering and data science teams in, which are different teams that are now working on real-time threats. This is kind of where the action is. Are they rubbing together? Are they, you know, what's what is what's your thoughts and reaction to that? And what what are you guys seeing happening? So so we have two sleepy giants really take off for us after generative AI. We are getting more work around master data management, which is organizing an organization's data, and then securing an organization's data, doing role-based access, making sure there is. Uh, good data sanity in terms of what gets absorbed into the model. So I feel data is the underlying layer behind Gen AI, and we are seeing organizations more in that foundational stage of yeah. doing better with their data to make sure they can leverage Gen AI in a much more effective manner. And I feel that trend will continue. Gen AI continues to generate more data, and so you yeah. will need better exponential I mean, it, it's just going to continue to cycle up. Oh, can I have a follow-up question for something you said a little bit earlier? When you're talking about making sure that your models are secure, you know, Gen AI warfare basically between two Gen AIs. How long when you're when you're because you work with so many different customers? When you're working with a, a customer, how long does it take you to spin up that model to a point of trust where you feel like it's going to be secure and able to defend? So it depends on what you want the model to do and what is the level of risk involved in the decision that the model is making. Right. So, so the way I explain this to my clients is, think of it as me adding a firewall of wisdom to your very young AI model that can yeah. think like a kid sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so if you want it to decide what is an attack versus what is normal activity, and you're going to have a human overlay it, then maybe that is ready in 30 days, 45 days. But if you want something more advanced that is making decisions on access provisioning, yeah. that is probably a six month journey. And so we need to figure out the yeah. use case, look at the risk behind it. That's where good governance comes into play right. around risk management. And then you have these effective models. And just imagine this is the sort of thing that our customers are yeah. dealing with right now. So yeah. we have to, at scale, create the kinds of controls on a few different levels. Yeah. to be able to protect the model, the application, the infrastructure, and the data. And so things, controls it's it a lot. Able Actually, yeah. I mean, it's a big world, yeah, but yeah. you know, we have to do it to be able yeah. to make it safe to use AI in production yeah. and to do that quicker than the bad actors are going to be using it against us, right? Yeah. And so things against, you know, pro prompt injection, um, yeah. you know, notebook security scanning, being able to monitor all this. I mean, one of the things that, that we're doing is protecting all of the four layers and then surfacing that in security command center so yeah. that the cloud security analysts can see workload performance across these different vectors, which is going to be critical since it's yeah. a new attack, attack vector. Pupin, where are we in the progress bar with customers? Because <laughs> you have the confluence of, um, you know, this inflection point of lot complexity, now you got multiple clouds, you have multiple environments, edge to core, and, they, and real time is happening. So what are some of the best practices and where are the customers right now? Are they setting things up? Are they trying to reduce the steps it takes to do something? Are they trying to make it easier? How would you peg? Are they overwhelmed? How would you peg? They probably are overwhelmed, but, but where would you peg yeah. the progress and what are some of the best practices you could recommend? Yeah. Um, let me give you some real life stories, right? Let me tell you what yeah, my please. clients are currently uh, doing. So, just about four weeks ago, we did a completely Gemini powered war game for one of my clients. And it is almost 70, 80% there where what would take us 200, 300 hours to generate a war game took 20, 30 hours, we yeah. delivered it. That's an order of magnitude. Yeah. Gemini was able to uh, assess responses, and, and generate the next in, uh, inject after it. So pretty effective 
with low risk activities. Another place where I'm using Gen AI very effectively is analyzing malware, taking an APT, uh, using it on Mandiant TI to get good effective IOCs and so on. So to, to answer your question, there are users in pockets where adoption is really quick, but when I talk to my clients, Steph calls it usability, I call it operationalization, but my clients want to start getting value out of it day one. So what can we operationalize with low risk? And that's where uh, Gemini integrated into SecOps comes into play. I can get value out of it day one for you. Within 60 days, you are seeing cost reduction. You, you are seeing a partner in crime helping you fight crime. And, and, yeah. and that's when we are seeing a lot of value. We, we just had an example where uh, Etsy was able to migrate a bunch of their detection roles within a week over using Gemini and just having to sort of edit about 20% of them yeah. because of the breadth that Gemini has. But back to your question about data science, yeah. data engineering and all that coming together, you know, the big, the large language models, and Gemini's amazing, too many you know, token yeah. context window, yeah, huge. but it doesn't necessarily know what a Mandiant analyst knows when it's doing yeah. an investigation, <laughs> right? So we have to pair that with the precision of something like a specialized LLM. We have one called SecLM that's been trained, Deloitte's been helpful in this as well, on yeah. some of the ways in which an analyst conducts an investigation. And so bringing that breadth and that depth together sure. is what enables you know the in-product experience to be precise. So first of all, Gemini is getting great traction. Congratulations on that front, Google, Google at large. But specifically to, to security, do you guys have a scenario where it's like be a Mandiant analyst <laughs> and use okay. a pilot AI system because I can see the simplification of the data being formed on behalf of the two teams to take all that that grunt work of That's wrangling right. data so the UX meets um, coding. You got it. So take us through that, because this is where the, I think everyone's focused on right now. Can you guys should both share? That's yeah. a hot topic. Well, I'll, I'll give an example. In Gemini and SecOps, we have an investigation assistant, and the whole point of that is that I'm in my tool. I don't have to go learn some new yeah. surface. I'm a defender. I already have a bunch of those that yeah. I have to toil across, right? So. I'm in my tool and I can ask a natural language question. Hey, tell me about this particular piece of malware. We are able to go, Gemini goes and gets the latest frontline intelligence. So it's grounded, which prevents the hallucinations and brings that in and then takes next step to look over, let's say the last 90 days of your activity to see if you have any IOCs. That kind of collapsing of the roles, the jobs, yeah. the tasks, is where we're at right now. We're still in a very yeah. early assistive phase. Yeah. Before we can get to this semi-autonomous phase, which we will, yeah, yeah. where I say, hey, just being a Mandiant analyst, do some always on threat hunting. I have confidence in that, and I'm going to trust But the needle is moving, in your opinion, yeah. now. Yeah. Your thoughts, where you see that? Yeah. Uh, by the way, we need an AI-powered thermostat in the room for sure. I don't know if that's how you're in this right now. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm activating my core right now. It's the nest for the desk right now. Yeah. Yes, we need a little more work. <laughs> so, I think where the reality is today is human plus. So yeah. when you see the SecLM model, which Agreed. is grounded in security uh, data, mm -hmm. I think it is augmenting our security analysts. It is not taking over from there. But to uh, be able to go to a model and say, generate IOCs and generate an investigation query for me and Yara, is extremely powerful. Yeah. yeah. And, and and that's where I feel purpose-driven models yeah. will come into play more and more. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to ask a friend of mine where to go for pizza when he eats sushi all the time. You you need yeah. the guy who eats pizza all the time. What so a great metaphor. So, so you need purpose-driven yeah. context. Is everything grounding in context, as you well, said. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about pizza already. It's it's. Oh, well, now yeah, we're hungry, stuff, so uh, that'll warm us up. We need yeah. to no, I lost all my questions. So I'm yeah, so, thinking okay, about okay, sushi and so, pizza. So I have a question for you because you just brought up something that I think is really interesting. We've, you've given some great examples of, of where Gen AI is great for solving problems in security. Is there anywhere where it's just blatantly not the solution? Or do we think it's good? It, let me tell you this. It is always the solution, provided you train it correctly. Let me give you an example. Oh, yes. I'm, we are working with a client in high-tech manufacturing. I'm going to change a few names, but they build alloys with platinum. And they trained it with a lot of data, including airline data of loyalty programs. 
So now you think platinum is a status about flying, but it also goes into alloy, which confuses the AI in terms of what responses to give. Of course. I'm just giving you an example. But if you get your data practice correctly, if you have good master data management, where separate data is training different data sets, and you have a purpose-driven model, I feel chances of hallucination go down. But you need to think through it thoughtfully even before you start on that yeah. journey and, and get the right underlying data. Yeah. yeah. Go for it. I have a slightly different perspective. Let's go. Uh, I don't think, maybe it's the opposite perspective now that we're saying it out loud, but like, I don't think the AI is the solution for everything. If something like a rule is able to get the job done in combination, wrapped in some of the generation or some of the translation that LLMs in particular are uniquely positioned yeah. to do, yeah. I think it can be transformative. What, you know, sort of static, you know, age yeah. old technology, let's call it, let's call the new stuff together. Yeah. I think we have a lot yeah. of runway still there to do and throwing AI at the problem isn't always the same. So uh, this brings up the re- curious about, or to be expensive to solve the problem. Yeah, and some problem like, Again, because we're still early days, back yeah. to the level of confidence that somebody might have to move some Gen AI into their critical workflows, right. we still have a lot to get that specialization right. Yeah, and, and, and that's so why I talk about human plus, right? Does it yeah. give you additional plus content? Human is a nice way to yeah. Yeah. frame well, it. Well, yeah, let's let's get that into uh, uh, reinforced learning with human feedback. Big, a big topic in the algorithm side of it. We heard on Mandy and say, for the first time I heard him on the keynote say, human in the loop. Human reinforced learning, no, reinforced learning with human feedback is a big part of how these models are working. This brings up the comment he said about, hey everyone in the audience, Gen AI is being used by all the users, get used to it, it's never going to go away, and so have a policy. So you have security people tend to be like, I really don't want the AI, I want to make sure we have everything tight and buttoned up, but it's in there now. So how do you manage that human aspect driving the AI? How does that weave in? What are customers thinking about? Is it early days? Because the human, in the loop will be a key. Yeah. Because it's in the reinforced learning now with human feedback. Yeah. So I think that's why I agree with Steph, right? If you ask me, is the model there today? I think we are still in the generative era of the world. We are not in predictive or action era of the world. I would not trust a model to go block something for me or go make a decision in my cloud infrastructure. I would though want it to inform my analyst some more to go make that decision. And to your point, that will keep entering into the feedback, feedback loop, and, and that model is just going to keep getting better. But I feel that's the foreseeable future, yeah. and that's where someone like us comes into play. I monitor hundreds of accounts, hundreds of clients, right? And the model that we are training is a bit more versatile in terms of what it can do, and then we are able to apply it into different yeah. use cases, and, and we have good predictive yeah. Uh, insight as to what it does better and what it doesn't. Yeah. I think that's a good differentiation. We talk, we talk at a scale of manual, assistive, semi-autonomous, autonomous. Yeah. And human in the loop. Right now, we're in the assistive phase doing low risk things like natural language summary, yeah. natural language yeah. input translation, that sort of thing. We're not, at, and we're actually not doing immediate you know, feedback. So what the user is doing is not immediately retraining the model. That's also very expensive. We're yeah. taking that in. We're very, we're sort of critically doing model updates, right? But to get to that state of semi-autonomy, we're sure. Let's say a low-risk malware triage. Yeah. We would want to have Gemini tee that up, and the user would have to say, "Yeah, go ahead and do that." We're going to be in that stage for a while, but yeah. we're not there even yet. So that's where that's where people talk about guardrails, input-output yeah, controls. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't want Gemini to do something that I haven't explicitly given yeah. it. Approved. Okay, so we get some guardrails around this. Especially in security. It's, it's right? kind of like we're in the we're in the low end of the pool with the bubble on, you yeah, know, like, like you know, swimming out to the yeah, like, like, yeah. like kid around me. He's like, okay, yeah, like, yeah, yeah but guardrails. Yeah, this is where the guardrails come in. That that's where the, the safety governance comes in, and some of the explainability. We still in that it. because it's it's real risk. We need to have precision and confidence yeah. in the security yeah. space. Yeah. Curious, you're both at two very famous companies that most people have heard of on this planet, <laughs> and you're dealing with a lot of talent within your own organizations as well as talent skills gap when it comes to your customers that you're serving. How are you seeing, or, or even how are you doing it internally? How are you attracting the top talent in this rapidly emerging, growing space? I mean, AI has been around forever, but we're going to do that first. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so first of all, we have we are a very talent-centric organization. We Deloitte, I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like finding a unicorn 
and then making sure the unicorn can code in Python, right? It's it's not going to happen. It's a very talented unicorn. Yeah, it's not going to happen overnight. So training individuals and not just people who work in our team, that's why we have very yeah. specialized programs for CIOs and CISOs on adopting AI, uh, proliferating that uh, talent downstream. Yeah. But we'll have to solve that problem together. Google, Deloitte, all our peers, where we'll have to train the next generation of uh, Gen AI and AI leaders. Yeah. yeah. And that's why the rise of center of excellence is cross team training comes in. So we're kind of in those kind of formative years yeah. of thinking. any best practices on team training, cross training, centers, is that, is that two group think or is that kind of where we're at right now? I, I think there's something interesting that's happening right now, which is there's always been a cyber talent gap, finding the expert practitioners, for example, we think Gen AI is going to be able to, I need to come up with a better metaphor than move the ball down the field, but that's what I'm using right now. To say. <laughs> yeah, we, we love all sports analogies. So. Yeah, we move the ball down the field for the experts. They don't have to do yeah. low value th sorts of things. Yeah. And then new folks coming in are able to, you know, be more productive early on. But the experts are now training yeah. some of these models on how they work and really getting that expertise into these systems so that they can become more semi-autonomous over time. And the data scientists, again, are now learning about these use cases that are specific to threat intel and security. And so there's this kind of yeah. interesting merging that's happening because of the potential that we're all in the Well, we definitely, want, we definitely right want to follow up with you guys on that because I think as we get our research going, we're watching all this, it's, it's evolving very, very fast with great improvements on the business operations today. Yeah but yet the vulnerabilities are coming in real time. So again, it's the balance of how do you get that real time capability? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I got one more question for you because it came up when we were chatting ahead of time. This has been really fun. Our time's flown oh. by, sidebar. Uh, so one of the lovely things about living in San Francisco and Palo Alto, John, you can relate, is our billboards are the nerdiest billboards on the planet. I think without question, <laughs> there, there's always some, I feel like okay. right now, every, it comes black every question. single one of them says AI on it right now, but you brought it up earlier uh, and, and, and when you, when you Propose this question, I could see it as one of our Silicon Valley billboards. So what's the sock of the future look like? Because <laughs> that would literally be on one of our billboards. By the way, I'm from Ohio, and I love our billboards in Ohio, by the way. It's sort of like, you know, pole barns. Yeah. It's all it says on the billboard. But anyway, every billboard comparison. We should have AI pull up some of the best billboards in the Okay, state. let's, see. let's see if that becomes part of MY. Yeah. There, but. I'm, I'm thinking about the Los Angeles uh, billboards now, but sock of the future. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I'd go back to what I said earlier. Sock of the future is all about crossing that bridge between generative to predictive AI and, and converging your SecOps with your cloud security, with your EDR, and with all the other tools that you have in your tool stack to make better, faster decisions with that human plus in mind. I feel yeah. we have a real opportunity over the next few years yeah. to at least have a very effective human plus model and combat the bad actors. Yeah, then we, we had authored a co-authored a paper on this yeah. and I definitely think it's back to John, that question that you had asked earlier. There is a convergence right now because of the Gen AI and the SOC of the future is going to bring together clouds, the vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that are part of the cloud yeah. experience the active yeah. threats that are part of the SecOps experience, the research that's part of the CTI experience, yeah. that's, all of that is yeah. urging, and it's going to give the defenders the advantage. I, yeah. I'll, I'll give a huge shout out to my team that worked on that uh, uh, white paper while I have this opportunity, but Mitch yeah. and Alex, and they, they are somewhere here, uh, fantastic work on that uh, white yeah. paper. Antin collaborated with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is a must read if you are building a sock or thinking about transforming your sock. Right. Well, you guys, I love that. it's a must read. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you guys are, you, you guys are always great on theCUBE. We've been following Deloitte for many, many years now, going back a decade, yep. always on the customer side of it from a tech pro perspective. But the guardrails here, this is fun. This is the best time to be in tech right now. I got to say, Amen. you know, I yeah. Sure. Couldn't agree yeah. John. Wow, well this has been great. We're over time. You're both brilliant. Yeah. I'm excited we have you coming up again in another <laughs> See you in We're yeah. gonna have to get you back on. This was this was great. You were absolutely fantastic. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks for taking thank the you. time. And thank all of you for tuning in to our two days of coverage here at MYS in Denver, Colorado. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.